Hello, everyone. I am Bishop Kelvin Simmons, and this is my wife, Prophetess Laquetta Simmons, and we are co-pastor at Emmanuel Praise Fellowship, and we welcome you to our YouTube channel. Yes, we invite you to subscribe today. Every week you will find new Bible studies and a weekly worship experience for you to view in your homes. So again, we invite you to subscribe and welcome to our YouTube channel. Next time you're riding down the road in your car, sing this to the Lord. You'll get where you're going much faster. Come. Let us. Come, let us adore him. Kneel down before him. Kneel down before him. Clear that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Jeremiah 29, 11 promises that God has a plan for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Kneel down before him. Kneel down before him. Bible study, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel Praise Fellowship for Bible study. We will welcome everybody in the IE, across the state and around the world. It is an awesome time for us to get together during this holiday season to study the Word of God together. We hope that you all had a very Merry Christmas and that God blessed you over this holiday weekend, past weekend, and we're looking forward to seeing you guys on Sunday to worship in the new year. In the new year. Wow. In the new year. You know, we put in 2021 behind us. We ate all the Thanksgiving. We ate all the Christmas. And you open up all your Christmas gifts. Some of your children need to take some of that stuff back. <laughs> Your parents got to work overtime now, but we pray, uh, we just just thank God that there was an awesome time. Definitely. So as usual, we want you to get your pen and paper out. We're going to be continuing our study on apathy. Spiritual apathy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Last week we had uh, awesome teachers, right? We did. We, we had did. Uh, Sister Regina Dean. She taught on familiarity. You know, the more familiar you get, the more stale it becomes, and then we become stale in our service. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, Mother Michelle and Sister Toya on disconnection, mm -hmm. right? And, and if you listen to Mother Michelle, she says uh, we should always be intentional. Be intentional. Be intentional about connecting. So we're going to continue that series tonight. Definitely. And we have two outstanding teachers for us who are going to teach you tonight. Yeah, and so we're going to quickly, when we come back, we're going to just overview those last topics we talked about last week, and then we're going to introduce to you our speakers for teachers for this week's lesson. 
So we're going to jump into that right after this. Welcome to Emmanuel Praise Fellowship YouTube channel and Facebook page. We, we are, are the Stoneham Stone family. family. And on behalf of Bishop Kelvin and Prophetess Aquata Simmons, we invite you to like, subscribe, follow, and share. For more information about our ministry, go to our website at www.emmanuelpraisefellowship.org. Thank, Thank you for, for tuning, tuning in to the, the church, church that we love. love. Wow, that was the Stonehams. Yes. And when they did that, it was just two of them. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, Sister uh, Joella, thank you. So, we want to just again give you what spiritual apathy is, and we're going to just give you brief sentences about what we talked about last week. So, if you missed it, you'll catch up. So, spiritual apathy is a feeling of indifference or even a coldness of things of God, and it can affect any believer. Anybody, no matter how long you've been saved or been in the church, even the one who's fully sincere in his faith and her faith. My clicker got apathy. <laughs> <laughs> so we just asked the question, is apathy creeping into your life? And there were indicators regarding if uh, spiritual apathy has crept into your life. Yeah, yeah. So we just want to talk about real quick the two that we talked about last week. So... The, the, oh. the, well, the first one was Sister Regina Dean. Yes. And she talked about familiarity. Right. And she talked about um, taking for granted the, the, the word of God, scriptures, taking for granted the things of God and how that affects how we interact and not interact with the body. And that those are critical um, to staying connected, which transitioned into our topic about disconnection. One, one, one thing quickly on the spiritual apathy and being familiar. Uh, it was a point that stood out that Sister Toya uh, raised in activity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not being dormant, yeah. not, not, not uh, letting life and your spiritual life just go by, go by but get, get, get active. And get active in the body, get active in, in service, and that will uh, eliminate the tendency of being spiritually apathetic. Right, right, right. Um, so we're going to transition. So after this commercial break, we'll bring in our guest speakers. They're going to talk to you about the next two um, attacks that let you know if you are spiritually apathetic. So yes. we'll be right back. Welcome to Emmanuel Praise Fellowship YouTube channel and Facebook page. We, we are, are the Stoneham Stone family. family. And on behalf of Bishop Kelvin and Prophetess Aquata Simmons, we invite you to like, subscribe, follow, and share. For more information about our ministry, go to our website at www.emmanuelpraisefellowship.org. Thank, Thank you for, for tuning, tuning in to the, the church that, that we love. love. Hello, family. How are you guys doing this evening? Happy Kwanzaa. Hope you guys had a Merry Christmas. All right, so I am Sister Deandra Fawcett, and I am going to be speaking with you guys today on uh, meteorocity. So I just want to start off by defining what I found, uh, what is, you know, meteorocity, and that is the quality or state of being barely adequate, poor, or inferior. And so as this week... As I was thinking about, you know, mediocrity, I was thinking, what makes me mediocre? And so I have a question to pose to you guys just to think about throughout this lesson to everybody out there is, uh, what is making you, you see you as capital, what is making you mediocre? And why is it making you mediocre? Like, why are you choosing to stay in a state of mediocrity? So as we know, to be mediocre is to be, you know, below average. So why are we choosing to be below average? And so as I was speaking uh, with others and as I was studying this, you can go next slide, um, I was thinking, how do we fall into this? And 
I came to the conclusion after studying and praying and talking to God that we become mediocre when we seek the approval of humans. Yeah. So Colossians uh, 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And so the more we work for human and human masters, that's how we become mediocre. As I mentioned, it's Kwanzaa. And if you know anything about Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa speaks about these principles, these principles that make us as a people great. And I was thinking, you know, um, how do we as a people become a little bit mediocre? And we began, I thought that we began to, we saw human attention and human affection over God's infection, right? Um, to uh, Monday, I believe it was uh, Kuji. And that means self-determination. So somewhere down the line, we began to let others determine who we are instead of being who we are determined by God. And so if we see next slide, it's, you know, the question is, who does God say we should be? And we know that God has called us to excellence. The opposite of mediocrity is excellence. And so in 1 Peter 2.9, it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, um, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so when I was thinking, I was meditating on this scripture, um, I thought that God has just called us to be excellent. He has not called us for a life of mediocrity. He called us for a life of excellence. And you know me, I'm always going to bring stuff back to our people, who we are as Africans. Right. <laughs> uh, so a quick little story, you know, I'm in a doctoral program. I'm getting my, my doctorate. And this, right. about two weeks ago, I was in Arizona in, uh, you know, a classes with other people. And there was a group of these black women, a lot of black women. But there was about four of us talking. Mm -hmm. And we were complaining. And we, <laughs> we were. We were like, you know, we have other cohorts, Caucasian males, and we were thinking, why we always got to be better than them? <laughs> why is our professor, who's a black woman, giving us a hard time and raining our papers harder? Why we got to, you know, we here studying until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning trying to get our stuff together, and we see, you know, Tom over there at the bar. Like, right. why do we have to put so much into this? And he just could go out there in his shorts and his wrinkled t-shirt and present and we're in here in our business outfits and we're our hair is put together and we're waking up early and we're looking our best and I started to think it's because we're called to be excellent right right That's we're because God has called us to be excellent God did not call us to be like Tom right, right? so <laughs> during this program we're thinking oh, we have to be excellent because that's who we are as Christians as people as Africans we're just called to be excellent so um, now the question came for me is, how do we overcome, you know, mediocrity? How do we get over this feeling of um, not wanting to be our best? And what came to me was study. Mm -hmm. Study who we are, know who we are. And 2 Timothy says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, you know, Timothy 2.15 tells us that we should study we should study and show God that we understand truth, our truth. Uh, this verse rever uh, refers to knowing God's word and being able to point out false teachings and philosophies. But it applies to education as well. As students, which we all should be constantly, we all should be students of the word, uh, we should indulge ourselves in our work and be the best that we can be. You know? Absolutely. So I know that for me, I personally, I struggle with, wanted to stay mediocre, especially this past year right. of seeing if so-and-so's not doing that, I'm not going to do it, you know, especially coming out of COVID. Well, you know what? I'm used to, I'm a teacher, so I'm used to working for three hours, being online and taking a nap after. So why should I give my students more when I'm used to being mediocre? So I know for me, I'm learning to study. I have a question, going back to that question of what's keeping you guys mediocre, if you are mediocre, because I know, you know, I this know is, like, these, are, man, these are the Shafay things. This, they're not mediocre, <laughs> but there are some things that you may be mediocre. So I have a question for you guys. What keeps you mediocre? And if it is, why? And if not, how do you stay out of mediocrity, you personally? That's for you. I'll, I'll go. Um, routine, mm -hmm. get, getting into a routine that's comfortable so um something my father used to tell me all the time is like you know 
as you the reference you use about you and the ladies in Arizona, mm-hmm. um, he's always taught me and my siblings that you need to do 110 percent um, as an African American person and so um i found that mediocre creeps in when you get into a routine that's comfortable so i try to refer back to what my father told me um as a young person and um impress myself to become uncomfortable that was good i mean for me i think it's one of those things you have to really you have to believe it you know, you have to believe that you are a king. I tell my daughter and my son, I'm, I'm a king myself, but I have a princess and a prince at home, you know, and I let them know that they are truly mm-hmm. royal and don't let anyone tell them otherwise. So, again, I, I practice what I preach. Um, it's not being conceited, but being confident in who you are, mm-hmm. you know, because society will tell you what you should be, but don't listen to them. Listen to your dad. Because I'm going to tell you who you the are. Dad. And again, I think they've, they've taken that and we, I continually push them. My wife continually pushes our kids to be better, to never settle. Not to saying, you know, again, I'm not telling you to do anything you can't achieve. If you set your goals and your sights on it and you prepare and you do the work, you can succeed. Right. That's good. I like how you said that. Listen to your dad, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Listen to your dad. I was thinking, yeah, listen to your father, who he says who you are, because he says it in here again in Peter, that we are a royal priesthood, that we are kings and queens and we are royalty. So, you know, that's good. And uh, Sister Sherbete, you mentioned uh, not falling into a just a routine. And to me, when I think of routine, I get bored Mm -hmm. with routines. And so with that said, can you guys just speak to us more on like, boredom and have what that means and absolutely okay so i'm gonna turn it over to you guys you guys can speak to us a little bit on boredom so you know boredom is also um a sign of spiritual apathy yeah um and and to be honest boredom is not in this sense not the traditional boredom boredom um it's a little bit different as it relates to spiritual apathy. Um, so just kind of think about, you guys, boredom as it relates to spiritual apathy. It's not the, tra- the traditional boredom. So just keep that in mind as we go along. Um, John Bloom defines boredom not as the opposite of busyness, but as the opposite of interest. So basically, we need to pay attention to what that lack of interest really represents. Everyone or anyone can become uninterested from time to time, but an excessive feeling of disinterest, that's spiritual apathy. We must listen to our boredom. Um, It's telling us something important. It's a hunger for happiness and a sign that we need to pursue God's presence. And uh, G.K. Chesterton said, there is no such thing on earth as an uninteresting subject. The only thing that can exist is an uninterested person. And that's true. So for me personally, I found myself residing in Boredom's house uh, for a while there. Uh, Just a brief story. Um, It was years ago after my wife and I left the divorce church. That's not the real name of the church, but it is what it is. And, you know, I was just done with it. You know, I was like, you know what? We've tried a few churches. And uh, again, uh, full transparency. I was born and raised Catholic. My wife is Baptist. So we're trying to find something that works. Right. There is nothing that works. Right. Um, so, you know, we had to, so we searched, but we went to a couple of churches and uh, the divorce church was just the final straw. And so I was like, I'm just done. We're just going to take some time off. But I, I realized that, you know, I was actually robbing my wife and my children of their spiritual growth as well. So, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, I allowed myself to stay in that zone for, for several years. And then I decided to, to make a change. You know, I decided to move out of boredom's house and into a new house the house called emmanuel praise fellowship yes. that's where the church says amen. Amen. Yeah. amen so you know you have to kind of look at boredom in this way it's it's a warning but it's also an invitation you know it's a warning that something is interfering with your joy but see it's also an invitation to do something about it so don't don't take up residence there and allow it to consume you because there should be nothing that can ever take your joy away. That's good. Next. Next slide. That's it. So there's a few scriptures we like to share that again, so when boredom starts to creep in and you just start feeling like you've become complacent in some, in some cases, just think of John 10.10. 10. 
uh, and it goes, the thief, a thief, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's good. And also, when you guys are feeling that feeling of uh, boredom and thoughts of boredom, um, and you can't mess, muster up the interest of your own loved ones, your pastors, um, people, especially in your life of what they're saying or what they're doing, remember Ephesians 6, 16 through 17. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the church said, amen. amen. That's it. So as we just wanted to just engage you guys in a couple more questions before we transition to the next topic. So you shared some of your personal struggles with some of your topics. How can you help people like you transition from the consciousness of understanding that excellence is more important or that you have to pursue your own interests as opposed to waiting on somebody to entertain you? How can you help people transition and move from that point? I think Sister Regina mentioned this last week, and awareness is very important. You have to be honest with yourself and say, I am being mediocre right now. <laughs> like, I am not living up to my potential. And then for me, what helps is trying to figure out that why. I mean, it always goes back to trying to please somebody else, but trying to figure out who are you really trying to please and why are you trying to please that group of people or that person or be like that person. And then... Um, Talk to God, that's what I can say. Talking to, you know, I, we underestimate when we, when we fall into these things, we think that we can hide, right? We can hide our mediocrity. We can hide being mediocre, but people see you. Like, God sees you. Like, you know, we think that um, I'm going to be, you know, here, and if I just fly under the radar, that I'm not going to be seen, and people are not going to call on me, but they do. And also knowing that... Um, when you're mediocre, it doesn't just affect you. I think too, we think that when we don't live up to our potential, that it just affects us and I'm cool in this space and everybody else is gonna be cool, like mind your business, I'm good. Not knowing that, for a lot of times as believers, your business is my business, my business is your business, right? So when you don't live up to your potential, who are you hurting? Like, who are you making mediocre because you are mediocre? So I just try to think about, yeah, think about that. got to come down um, a couple of weekends ago and she shared with me that her adult daughter that's soon to be 30 um, shared with her that you know I appreciate the Shabetes. Um I watched them as a young couple I had no idea that this young lady was watching us in that capacity you know they were friends of the family but you just never know who you can impact and who's watching so it's not just about your own mediocre of how it impacts you individually it's impacting others so had we made different choices and not conduct ourselves the way we did in the church that we were in at that time we could have perhaps swayed this young lady to make some not so great choices so it's also impacting others and, and i think it really it's important to understand who the enemy is you know i think sometimes you know i, I had a bishop tell us once that the devil knows the bible better than anybody and he uses it against you and if you allow yourself to buy into it, then you will find yourself in situations um, that you shouldn't be in. You will find yourself pulling back from the church instead of going to the church. I'm a witness to it. Uh, I, you know, you, I fell victim to it um, because I was looking for something, but I wasn't looking for the right thing in the church. Every sermon is not for you. So you can't think, oh, I didn't get nothing from this sermon. but you go, most of them are, <laughs> most of them are. And so really making sure that I have that foundation, I've set that foundation for my children, because again, you know, um, with social media and things like that, there's a lot of things that can distract the youth away from the church. Um, so again, you have to have that solid foundation at the house, my wife and myself, to make sure that the kids understand that you're going to church. 
You know, we old school. You're going to church. Um, you might be off this week, but you'll be back at church. So again, really making sure they understand that you have to understand, you have to get into the word. Otherwise, you're, you're fair game. And the, the devil's good at what he does. Um, no, I, I, I was thinking about, I have my microphone. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I was thinking about uh, when DeAndre was speaking on mediocrity and l listening to the subjects. Uh, there's, there's the old saying that uh, one bad apple can spoil, spoil the bunch. And when you look at it scientifically, what happens is you can have a bag of, of apples, five apples, right? And one go bad. When that one goes bad, the gases from that one apple start permeating the skin of the other apples and ruins them. And so that's why it's so important that we have to identify these characteristics of being apathetic because it's just not going, it's just not going to end with one person. That it, the, the spirit of medi mediocrity can latch on real quick. The spirit of boredom can latch on real quick. So now it's just not one family. It's just not two. It can be a, the whole left side of the church. So that's why it is important, what you're teaching us tonight. One last question. Why do you believe people are looking to be entertained in the church? What is that? that well, you come to church to be entertained. What is that about? What do you think? <laughs> I think one is we're a society of selfishness. Yeah. Like, you know, what am I going to... Everything is this... Um, I call it this notion of self-care. I think people took that idea of self-care too far mm -hmm. as if, if, if it's not serving me and solely me, then I can't be bothered with it. It is not the true self-care of, you know, being, you know, giving, helping, giving to others. They're taking self-care in this selfish state. So if like, if the message is going to talk to me, then I'm wasting my time. And I'm not coming back. Right. If it's not making me happy, not joyful, but if, if it's not making me happy, if it's not making me feel good, if it's not making me feel, you know, butterflies and ponies, and I don't want it. And that's just what it is. We don't want to be inconvenienced. That can be. And I, f I can add, um, just coming to church for the wrong reasons. Um, coming to be entertained because you enjoy praise and worship, but there's more to that. Um, so just coming to church for the wrong reasons is I think people kind of look to be entertained opposed to the word. And I just think a lot of things have been commercialized. Mm. You know, everything is commercialized. You see it and it's like, wow, it's glittery, it's shiny. But you know, like the old school folks said, everything that glitters ain't gold, you know? And uh, sometimes you have to find that out the hard way. And so again, I think that's a lot of times what uh, individuals are coming again, like my wife said, for maybe the wrong reasons, you know? Praise and worship, but after that, I, I check out. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, but again, I think, you know, again, for me, I'm just the opposite. You know, I like the word. Yeah. Uh, I like to learn. Uh, I enjoy the praise and worship. It, it sets the mood. But I like to, I like to hear the word. Because for me, I need the word. I got a lot of music going on up here all day long, so I'm good <laughs> on that part. But uh, I, I just think, again, that's probably one of the things. It's sometimes it's become a little bit commercialized, and people buy into that, and so they want to see explosions and <laughs> all this stuff uh, uh, on the stage. And again, that's really not what, what it's about. Yeah, you said something that Pete, you said that you need to learn. A lot of people feel like they don't need to learn anything. They're just here, you know, to say first, let me take a picture, put it on Instagram. <laughs> I came to church, you know, God, you see my Instagram photos, you see my spiritual, you know, you see my quotes, right? And then um, some people think that their presence is just that. And we're all, all our presence are important. But some people think that um, they're more of a blessing to you guys than you are to them. <laughs> wow. You know what I'm saying? So just me being in the building, you should just be happy that I chose to wow. put foot in this building. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, people are not here to learn anymore. They're here to be seen. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So, so uh, Brother Shabete, when you said that you're here for the word, right, uh, that means I can preach longer. You can. You can. Y'all heard it. <laughs> Y'all heard it from the big man right here. 
We want to thank you all. We're going to, um, after this commercial break, come back and conclude and wrap up this study on apathy. But you guys were a big help to us and the people of learning. So thank you guys. We want to thank all of our teachers who have gone before us and helped us in this subject of spiritual apathy. Yeah. We really appreciate their efforts and their dedication, but we want to wrap this up with passivity. Yes. Passivity. In general, the antidote to apathy is action. In 2009, Kevin DeYoung wrote a book aptly titled, Just Do Something. Do something. Just Do Something. In it, he writes, some Christians need encouragement to think before they act. Can I say that one again? <laughs> Some Christians need encouragement to think before they act. Others need encouragement to act after they think. <laughs> if, you, if, if you sense Holy Spirit convicting you of apathy, don't be passive any longer. Do something. Take one action, one step towards Christ. Have an honest conversation with a spiritual mentor. Join a ministry. Tell your wife, you'll give, you go, go to counseling, try something, turn off the phone for a whole day. Okay. <laughs> Say yes to that thing you've been meaning to do or no to that thing you've been trying to stop. Just do something. Take one step today to stir your soul to life. Yeah. And we always, we kind of want to counter that. When we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're feeling apathetic, we want to just not do nothing. Right. And, but, and that's Satan's goal. If Satan can get you to be still and do nothing, he wins. If Satan can get you to stay home and not connect, he wins. He understands the power of the assembly. Why do you believe that Satan is attacking that? Why do you believe he's trying to get people to stop coming to church, to stop connecting? Because he knows that when we gather, when we touch and agree, that we can change everything. So when you think, wow, you know, it's better for me not to do nothing, that's Satan telling you that. Because he knows that once you come to yourself and once you connect with the group, with the body of Christ, just that the, whole, the body of Christ, we become the body of Christ. So we become the body of Christ and we become the force of Christ, the power of Christ, the movement of Christ, the revelation of Christ. So listen to this. We often think, and we've taught against this so often, we often think that the devil comes roaring at us, punching us in the mouth. You know, the scriptures say he comes like a roaring lion. But he's also a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? And so he doesn't always come and make us do stuff, especially when it comes to passivity. So this is what it looks like. I'm going to church on Sunday, and I'm going to participate I'm going to do it. Then all of a sudden, uh, uh, he, he just slide in front of you uh, something to eat. Yep. And you said, OK, I'll, I'll eat this. And he said, OK, oh, that was good. I think I have seconds. And then you have seconds. And then, then he'll say, you got a few minutes. And then when you sit down, you just start feeling comfortable. That's the devil fanning you. Mm -hmm. Just getting you real good and passive. <laughs> and then next thing you know, you know, I'm going to go next Sunday. And you look up, you've done that for five Sundays in a row. So then you say, I'm not going to do that on Sunday. The devil said, cool, I'm going to get you on Saturday night. Get your mindset on Saturday night. Next thing you know, you're just chilling and you're in a passive state and there's no activity, no spiritual activity, not going to church, not praying. And then you say, oh, oh well, I'm good. I'm good. And it's a dangerous place to be, not just for you and your family, but the entire body of Christ. When you begin to negotiate, 
when you begin to describe your stance from worldly, worldly terms, like I'm, I'm burnt out, I, I need to take a break from church. That, no, that's not in the Bible. I, I, I need, you know, I, I need to do me. That's not in the That's Bible. not in the Bible either. So when you find yourself reciting words that are not biblical to justify your behavior, you know you're in trouble then. You know that's not of God. But you'll find people that are co-sign it because they want you to be on their side because your activism in the church shines a light on their inactivity. So they want you to hang out with them and do the things that they have. And they say, we're friends. God, when you're in that church, we're not friends no more. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're in that church, don't, don't you want to do something else? You ain't got no money. You're you giving it to the church. They try to badmouth your spiritual walk to get you to come to their side. Because if you come to their side, they're not reminded by what they're not giving to God and what they're not doing. They want you to become a leopard like them. Wow. So you got to be careful with that. Yeah. Get out of the I used to club. The people that you hang out with when you're being spiritually passive are the people who used to be active, too. Right. <laughs> right. I, I, I used to I used to sing in the choir. Yeah. I used to be an usher. When it what happened? I, you know, I just stopped doing it. Yeah. I, I, like Sister Dandre said, maybe they, they didn't get enough spotlight or something. Right. Or it wasn't. You know, I, I, I didn't get my pats on the back, so I, I, I'm cool with that. So I'm, I, I'm used, to, I used to do that. When, when you say, how many people say, I, you, Bishop, I used to. I'm like, well, why don't you now? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good like that. Well, we were having a conversation this morning, and we talked, no, we were on an anniversary. We talked about church hurt. And we believe that church hurt, we've come to believe that church hurt it's about when we get hurt by the church. But we don't talk about church hurt is when we hurt the church. Oh, we so, hurt the church? Right, right. It goes both ways. Mm, that have mercy. Your gossip hurts the church. Your um, deciding not to tithe hurts the church. You're not getting along with each other hurts the church. So I believe that church hurt really is that way. Mm -hmm. It's us hurting it, not it hurting us. Right. And what we don't realize is this, that if I say the church hurt me, what I'm saying is a person hurt me. Right. Two people hurt me, not the whole body. Right. And so if I hurt somebody, okay, God's going to deal with me, that one person. But when we say the church hurt us, and then we went out and badmouthed the church, we badmouthed the pastor, now you're badmouthing the body. You're not bad-mouthing one person. No. And now you're discrediting Christ himself. So it's not me or prophetess that's going to have to deal with you. Now you got to deal with God himself. Because right. what you're doing is you're saying God hurt you. Instead of saying there was a disagreement. Or well, what's in addition that, the, that, that God damaged you. Yeah. Damaged you to the point that now you have left the church. And do you want that to be God's reputation? Mm -hmm. And it's so funny is that before I married this wonderful man, I dated other men. And some of those men hurt me. I didn't stop dating men because they hurt me. <laughs> We're going to have to go back on that one. <laughs> I, I, I didn't give up on relationships because I encountered a bad dude. But we would drop the church instantly because we had an encounter with one person in the church. So now we leave the whole relationship gone. So what I'm trying to, what we're trying to tell you is that you are being hypocritical in your stance. Yes. Yeah. And that Satan is manipulating you to not come back to church, for you to be apathetic, for you to isolate yourself on a couple of incidences that, that, that should not have caused you to separate from Jesus, God, and the ministries right. that God sent you to help. Right. Um, um, one of the worst things that we can do is that, okay, you, you continue to go to church, but you're operating in your church hurt, and that puts you in a position of being passive. Right. So you come, and all you do is just take up space. You, 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 
uh, DeAndre said, you do your Instagram. They don't even care about the Instagram member. They just come and they just sit there. Right. Sit there. Judges. Throwing judging, stones. Throwing stones. And they, don't, they, they won't raise a hand. Killing the spirit. Kid, they're just, they're just taking. Satan is still using you as a distraction. Using you as, as a distraction. So uh, uh, um, we got to be conscious. Conscious. We got to be conscious of where we are. And the Bible is so true when it says the devil is the accuser. He's the slanderer. He's the snake. He's sneaky. And before you know it, he has you thinking that you're okay. That you're okay. And it's the passive people who always miss out on the special miracle. Yeah. You weren't there. You weren't available. And then you get, ooh, so-and-so, you should have been there today. The church was alive, and there were some people who got healed. Healed, and most of the time they got healed in the condition that you have. Yep. And because you decided not to be there because, hey, I could take it or leave it, you left it. So, I don't know. I'm praying that you guys will watch these two Bible studies over again, that you will take notes, that you will um, begin to ask God to reveal to you the parts of it that is you, the parts that could be you if you're not careful, the parts that you can help other people change and fight that, that we're in this life together. We're doing God together, that no one should try to get over their apathy by themselves. And that we should position ourselves as brothers and sisters in this kingdom to be there. Because at any given minute, moment, that we, 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 we exchange positions. Uh, I could be victorious and I could be fighting one day. I could be struggling one day. We each exchange that. So being prepared to be what we need for each other is critical. And it starts with doing this work yeah. and killing the spirit of apathy. A uh, prophet says she's praying. I'm going to let her pray. I'm going to do what the Bible says. In addition to praying, not just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. And I'm going to be clear on my uh, uh, teaching and, and my, when I say teaching, my example of going after that spirit of apathy. And it's not going to always feel good. Scripture tells us iron sharpens iron, right? Uh, uh, um, the scripture says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says, those of you who are spiritual, if you find anyone at fault, restore them. Be careful not to fall in what they do, but restore them. We're going to restore you. We'll restore you with prayer. We'll restore you with the word. And we will restore you with encouragement not to give in to that apathetic spirit any longer. Amen. Thank you, God. So we, we praise God for this lesson. Yeah. We thank God for all of our teachers. We praise God that we've got to see Christmas and we're going to see in a new year. Thank you, God. We thank God for that. And then listen, you all, in 2022 is the year of supernatural giving. Yay. You cannot be apathetic about that because there is there's, there's supernatural blessings waiting for those who, who's coming after him. Tell one quick story before we leave. Go ahead and tell it. So today, um, Sister Regina and I were at the 99 cent store. We were talking to this lady. She was so nice and friendly. So when she got to pay her thing, Holy Spirit told us to pay for her items. So Sister Regina said, hey, we want to pay for it. She said, what do you want to pay? I said, yeah, we want to pay for it. So we paid for her her items. She was, she was, you know, pleasantly surprised. The cashier talked about it more than she did. Every time we, when we got there, oh, it was so great. And we're like, oh, no, we're just happy to do it. So when we walk out the store, this man who we did not know looked at us and said, oh, you guys are wearing green today. That's a sign of prosperity. Then he looked us in his eye and said, the two of you will experience nothing but prosperity in 2022. He said, he said, you guys, he said, we don't know this man, but he blessed us. So you know what we did? We received, we received <laughs> outside the store. But I believe we encountered him because we supernaturally gave to that woman. We bought her groceries, we bought her stuff. Not wanting a blessing, but because we were obedient, 
because we were moving in the year of supernatural giving, because Holy Spirit told us to do it, we did it. And because we did it, God instantly blessed us with a blessing from a stranger. But we knew it was of God because we got chills when he was talking. We got chills. We, we, we didn't see it coming. That's how we're going to be moving in 2022. That's right. That God is going to tell us to give. We don't know why we're giving. We're just going to do it. We're going to do it with a smile. And we're going to instantly walk from that space of giving to another space of blessing. That God is going to have people who we, you don't know going to be pouring out, blessing you, speaking over you, and being in a state of supernatural giving, meaning that you are positioning yourself for supernatural receiving. Oh, please, Bishop, I pray that they don't sit out on supernatural giving. Oh, no, don't, don't, don't sit out. Uh, the, uh, the Bible tells us, be aware that we entertain angels unaware. I don't believe you angels. Right, exactly. And so that means that we just do what God tells us to do, like Prophetess and Sister Regina did, because it wasn't, it, they followed Holy Spirit, but God had placed an angel watching them, and, and an angel is only a messenger from God. That's one, a messenger from God. So that angel was standing there with the message. Had they not done what God asked them to do, that man wouldn't have said a word. That angel, but the angel had the word, and that word was attached to your obedience. Yeah. You, you all do not sit out on supernatural giving. My prayer, I told my wife driving over here when she told me that story, was this, that God will bless us so much that we will be looking for opportunities to give. Yep. Oh, don't you, you just, no, 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 don't hold my blessing back. Here, take this. No, I don't, no, 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 you take this. Yep. You take this. I was at a, uh, we were at a function and I, I saw a gentleman I said, that I knew, I said, hey man, I like that tie. He said, you do? He said, yeah, he took it off. Gave it to me. Gave it to me. And I told my wife right there, I said, you see that? She said, that's a nice tie. I said, now I got to find somebody to give a tie to. That's how you do it. Supernatural yep. giving just, we, we got to move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, okay, one more thing. One more thing before God. And so it's going to be days throughout 2022 that we're going to say, you guys, Saturday Supernatural Giving Day. Oh, Lord. And we're going to have each of you, wherever you are, give something. So whether you're in a 99 cent store, a State of Brothers store, you want to walk into an ice cream shop, or you want to go to a laundry shop, we ain't got to be together. But we're going to say, this is the day that Emmanuel Praise Fellowship is going to give supernaturally. And we're going to do it throughout the year. We'll give you a date. You be prepared. You know, it was only $12. We didn't know how much it was. We just was going to pay her whatever it was. We were prepared to pay it. So when it's supernatural giving day, it could be $5. It could be buying somebody's gas. We don't care. We just want the body of Emmanuel and the friends of Emmanuel in supernatural giving day to go out and bless the community. However he tells you, but we, we want you to be so tied into Holy Spirit that you do exactly what Holy Spirit tells you to do. Supernatural giving cannot happen if you have a passive spirit. Nope. Cannot happen if you're apathetic. Nope. Cannot happen if you're mediocre. mediocre. Cannot happen if you're disconnected. Cannot happen if you're so familiar with giving. Oh, here they go again. It cannot happen. If you're bored. If you're bored. But supernatural giving happens when you just do something. Yeah. And that something is give. Yeah. Thank you, God. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, any prayer requests? Um, we, I, my, my prayer request is that everybody tune in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Tune in the Holy Spirit. He's speaking and he has a blessing. He has promises just for you and your family. Listen for him, and then move when he says move. That's it. Happy New Year, everyone. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching IPF Live. And for more information about our ministries and services, please visit our website at www.emmanuelpraisefellowship.org. God bless, and have an amazing week.